Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Gary Dunning, President and Executive Director of the Celebrity Series of Boston. A veteran of Performing Arts Administration, Gary began his career at American Ballet Theatre before becoming Executive Director of Houston Ballet in 1986. Gary has also served as Executive Director of the Big Apple Circus. He has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Gary, for joining us today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. That is an amazing career. You have the Big Apple Circus, you have American Ballet Theatre, the Celebrity Series. It seems like your next step would be to be an astronaut or a fireman. <laughs> so talk about, talk about that trajectory, because it is so unusual as to be noteworthy, yet you have provided leadership to these great and renowned institutions over a career. Well, it, it's been, I mean, I'm very lucky and it's been fascinating to sort of go through the different companies and, and yes, indeed, I always get the questions of, well, if you worked at the ballet, how could you go to the circus? If you worked at the circus, how could you move somewhere else? Um, and people are always looking for what are the parallels and you know, what are the differences? And, and some of the things that I have noted over time is, I mean, it is about leadership. It's about leadership of nonprofit institutions, which have several things in common among them, volunteer boards, a need for donations, a need for strategic thinking, um, you know, good financial management, and then certainly within each of those, uh, there are very unique you know, aspects to it, from you know buying point shoes um, at a ballet company to finding land to put a tent and 56 trucks on for the circus, um, to celebrity series where we actually don't own any theater, so we have to collaborate with anywhere from eight, ten, twelve theaters every year just to do what it is we do, which is present great artists. And what you are actually doing is you're preparing the way for the art to be presented. If the canvas is not prepared, you can't paint. If the stage is not prepared, you can't dance and you can't perform. If you don't have the proper financial mm -hmm. wherewithal, you can't present uh, clowns or elephants or, or uh, acrobatic acts. Yeah. No, uh, it's, it's certainly the case that um, we have a unique role, and certainly in Celebrity Series, we have a specific role and a specific business mission uh, within a larger, greater vision for Boston. Um, so we'll talk often about that we want the arts to be a lifelong shared experience, theaters and schools and concert halls everywhere. Now our particular niche, my particular business that I do is bringing the world's best artists because we think they inspire and enrich a community. They really uh, um, you know, set the standard for what local groups want to be. Um, so you know, I have to partner with people here in Boston and uh, have throughout my career in order to run my business you know, quite efficiently. And I want people to succeed um, aside from ourselves. I certainly want my own organization to do well. But uh, one of the things that I think is so unique about the arts is that we, we really do flourish when everyone is doing well. Well, the arts are an ecosystem, aren't they? I mean, sure. it, even if you take uh, other ecosystems like, um, like uh, the baseball ecosystem, mm -hmm. you have teams that win and lose. However, if all the teams are not healthy, if you're not, if you're not making the market for baseball, then you will not have those stadiums filled, you will not have those TV contracts written, sure. and, and everybody loses. If you do not have people who appreciate dance, you will not have an audience. If yeah. you do not have people who appreciate live performance, uh, you cannot sell tickets, and yeah. you won't have donors, and you won't exist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so Boston's a great community because it has such high quality arts uh, and such depth in the arts, uh, certainly great conservatories, with all the universities in town, obviously there's departments of music and uh, theory, that uh, composition, and all of that, um, covering you know the full range from Berkeley College and its association with right. jazz and all of that. Um, so it's a wonderful community to work with, and, and quite concentrated since, a, as a city, it's small. It's it's very compact, um, and as a population, it's relatively small compared to some of the cities that I've worked in. So um, I, I find it a very exciting time in Boston, and it's really interesting watching and seeing how the arts are beginning to work together towards a larger vision rather than our own you know, short-term bottom line, as it were, even though that's obviously incredibly important. How do you select your artists? Uh, because there is a danger of becoming a mere uh, booking agent sure. for, 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 for I, I, artists. I, th I mean, I think one of the risks and one of the challenges is that uh, for Celebrity Series is we are essentially a packager of pre-existing brands. So people will come and say, Oh, I went to see Yo-Yo, Yo-Yo Ma, at Symphony Hall on Friday night. They're not particularly concerned who presented him, who made the deal work, and who took the financial risk, and who did the marketing. It, it doesn't necessarily 
uh, affect their direct experience of Yo-Yo Ma in concert, even though we, you know, we obviously have some role in there. So, I mean, part of the challenge is to help raise the profile for Celebrity Series to understand mm -hmm. that that curatorial role is important for the city of Boston. Um, and strategically, I think we definitely want to be seen and recognized as uh, a taste maker so that there is a built-up trust with our audience. So it's not that we just give you the big names, the celebrities, as it were, but in fact that we're identifying the younger artists uh, who you will hear about in a few years, but you can trust us uh, to present them uh, and see them earlier in their career. One of the things I, I like particularly about the presenting side of it is we really get to see artists throughout their career arc from their, you know, the earliest days when they're still finding their voice and still forming, you know, frankly, their, their musical and emotional and philosophical opinion about the world. Uh, and then follow them through when, uh, you know, they become the masters of their craft. Uh, and, and that arc for our audience, I, uh, I know they enjoy that because we have, we have uh, hundreds of households that have been subscribers for 25, 35, 45 years here in Boston, which is um, pretty unique, I think, for compared to a lot of cities. And the other uh, piece that you uh, implied uh, when you were talking about subscribers is that you're creating a, a trust and you're enabling people to take a leap of faith because it isn't so much of a leap having sure. experienced your um, your uh, programs previously, sure. um, they will take a risk. And, and all of a sudden you have art being experienced that otherwise might be avoided. Well, one of the things that, that um, when I first got here, which is just two years ago, and we did a strategic plan, that's a fairly standard sort of uh, process to go through, um, but we did uh, some surveying, some real questions and follow-up groups. And one of the things that we discovered that contradicted sort of well-held myths in the organization was that people actually um, cherished the variety that we were presenting. Because while they may, might self-identify as, oh, I'm a dance fan, or I'm a chamber music fan, or I like orchestras, that they also like that we offered them variety in different genres, jazz, dance, contemporary dance. So they could, in a sense, dabble, graze, if you want to call it that, just to sort of see what else is out there and test their own boundaries and test their own uh, limits of what they're familiar with. How is it different working in a context as you would in a ballet where you have an artistic director and you have a uh, administrative director, a, 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 an executive director, mm -hmm. uh, versus working in the type of organization that you're working now? Uh, this is the first time in my career that I've had sort of the sole responsibility to the board. Uh, right. Before that, it's always been the standard bifurcated you know, structure mm -hmm. and relationship. I would answer that by saying it's no different. You know, I, I have a, a director of artistic programming, uh, Amy Lamb, who is you know, one of the best in the business, and I absolutely regard her as my artistic partner in the same way that I regarded my artistic directors as my artistic partner. I, I'm there to sort of serve an artistic vision. It might be sort of their vision. In this case, it's, it's a shared one about where we want to take the organization. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, it's a little maybe cleaner line because in the sense of the board knows who exactly to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I, that's been really interesting, and I think it works really well in this particular setting. Um, it also works well in the bifurcated model. Uh, you just have to partner well and uh, really know yourself well to understand where your boundaries are, where your comfort level is, um, uh, and sort of understand, you know, understand when someone's pushing your buttons uh, <laughs> and, and be able to handle that without sort of making it personal because it, it, it's, I'm a firm believer in the notion of vision and mission, and mission as guiding principles for an organization and for individuals as they work together. Talk about the, the art of managing these art organizations. Well, I, I think a lot of it comes from um, a fairly rigorous self-discipline. Um, in a sense, you can, you can fall into the trap of uh, wishful thinking. Um, because I believe so much in my mission, because my, I think my mission is so sacred, Therefore, as long as I'm just making an effort, that's a good thing. Or even if you're just making great art, people are going to just come. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, you have to have, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I even like the term bottom line, but that's what it is. You have to have a rigorous assessment and grasp of that because that's a reality if you want to do this on a long-term basis and right. you want to think on a long-term basis. Um, uh, and you have to make some hard decisions because it's, you, it's easy to fool yourself sometimes about, um, well, if we go just one more chance or we'll try it one more time, you have to think what are the ramifications if things don't go well in next year's season or the season after that or five years from now as we begin to really 
um, you know, look on a longer term horizon. Well, it's, it's the joy and the burden, right? Sure. So that the deficit today needs to be make, made up tomorrow yep. or, and next year, and it's not going away until you fix it. Yeah, it's not sustainable. I mean, I think sustainable certainly is the new buzzword in, in a lot of industries, but um, it, it does apply in the sense of you have to make sure the decisions you're taking are ones that will sustain your organization over the long run. Uh, even if it means some short-term cutbacks, which we've all been through at various times with the economy, um, even if it means making an investment knowing well that you're not going to really see the returns for two or three years. If, if, if we're launching a new series um, to grow our, our jazz programming, it's not going to happen in one year. Right. Um, and we have to prepare both the organization and the board, sometimes even the critics, for you know, look at this in the context of where are we going to over a period of three or four or five years. And at the end of that five-year period, have we really built a, a larger audience in Boston for jazz? Have we built an audience um, you know, or built up again an audience for dance or contemporary dance, a particular type of dance? Isn't a product rollout, whether it is a automobile where you're coming out with a new idea mm -hmm. and you're not going to make the massive units because you don't know whether your audience is going to adopt them initially, and the rollout of a new series, don't those have certain of the same business attributes in terms of thinking about how you invest and how you inform absolutely. and absolutely you definitely have to go through that sort of process of preparing the audience um, preparing yourself and your organization for that long-term arc uh, however long it is um, build the framework for presenting it and why we're presenting it, or why we're presenting it in this particular venue um, I mean for a celebrity series I think one of the great advantages is that we don't have a home um, it means we're not in control of our venue as much, and that certainly presents a lot of obstacles and you know, frustrations at times. But um, we could not begin to have the profile we do artistically if we worked in a single hall that had 1,000 seats or 3,000 seats or 300 seats. It also keeps you very nimble. We have to be, because we're moving in and out. Uh, we'll have multiple concerts on the same day across town. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that's the, most arts organizations are far more nimble and resilient than I think they get credit for. Do you feel that the, uh, th that the audience has been affected by some of the changes in our media culture, the internet, different expectations, uh, a different demographic mix? Um, I think audiences have changed, uh, but I would probably say it's across uh, a lot of genres, um, and there's a lot of behavioral changes that have affected everyone from you know, the, the patterns we see in our business of later purchases, the reliance on single tickets as opposed to subscription, um, the, uh, you know, the somewhat impatience about, um, I, I just want to get through this sort of quickly, not investing their time, you know, which those of us in the arts can get fairly frustrated by. Uh, and yet, in some cases, we've adapted ourselves um, as, as artists and as an art field. So. You know, nowadays, you, it's pretty normal to sort of see a performance that might be a uh, hundred minutes with no intermission. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember performances when I first joined American Ballet Theater that uh, when we presented Giselle to act ballet, there was always an opening uh, ballet because it felt it wasn't, you know, meaty enough. Um, you had to go to the full three hours. And uh, now I don't think anyone would, you know, think of doing that. And that, that's certainly a response to the audience. And so we have the, the audience is beginning to adjust. We have a response by the presenting organizations. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the, the presenting uh, organizations are getting out in front of the audience and, and anticipating creatively, or do you feel like we're, we're still uh, sort of following the audiences? Because it is undeniable that, um, that performing arts organizations are really having a tough time sure. retaining their, their audience. And you see that in, in a drop in in ticket uh, revenue mm -hmm. and an increase in the cost I uh, of sales uh, of each ticket. Um, I, I think there is there is a, certainly a mixture going on. It is very easy in the let's just talk about the presenting side of it to um, try to do a calculation that says, well, what's just going to sell? Right. You know, I just want to make a profit. This should be like a stock portfolio, a set of assets that I dial up or down. With an well, asset that's allocation. easy. You just present what, what sold last year, right? And, and then you, you, you can take that formula, and some do, and, and some find that that works for them. Um, I, I find that until everybody's bored, nobody comes. Sure. I mean, I find that a little limiting because you're not bringing any sort of curatorial role, and you're not. Uh, it seems to me you're not expecting very much of your audience. Well, new is dangerous. Yeah. 
Um, this is Boston. It sometimes can you know, be seen <laughs> that way. It's a very conservative town. Um, but I think the good presenters, the ones I admire, are certainly ones who are prepared to lead their audience to something they may not have thought about before, they may not have seen before. Um, again, doing it uh, by finding those artists that are doing interesting work, but at the same time following those artists who, you know, the ones that I admire, who I want to have a dialogue with about where do you think uh, things are going. Um, so this year we'll present, uh, as part of our 75th anniversary season, uh, Mark andre Hamelin, um, a, a pianist who I admire greatly, great talent, has been around for a while, uh, developed a really solid career, but we asked him to curate just a three-part little series of what does it mean to be a virtuoso pianist today in the 21st century? How do you view that? How do you view the piano? Um, and I, you know, again, I was letting him go wherever he wanted to wander with it. And what we're coming out with is a solo recital, a duo recital with uh, Manny Axe. Uh, chamber music, um, you know, a nice interesting mix of things, but with threads to the past. So, like Great Virtuoso, he's presenting one of his own works. It'll be, um, an, I think, American premiere. So this is a considerable organization, and you have, you present uh, jazz, you present, uh, if I just look at your schedule here, it's just amazing. You have um, an outdoor installation of 75 pianos under uh, the heading of Play Me, I'm Yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is by artist Luke Jerram, mm -hmm. um, and then you have Sonny Rollins um, and uh, Wynton Marsalis, Gustavo Dudamel is mm -hmm. going to be here um, in March uh, uh, 2014. Uh, it, it is quite a, a, an amazing span of performance. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how the, the funding actually works. Is, sure. is this mostly through ticket sales or? Um, like a lot of organizations uh, and arts organizations, we rely on ticket sales and contributions, earned and unearned, as it's called. And revenue. your total revenue for, for an average year? Would um, be? This year we'll have a revenue of about $7 million. Um, this year we were running roughly 70% earned, 30% slightly higher on contributed revenue. That's quite good. Um, it's seen as good. Um, one of the things I talk about often is um, when I was at uh, the Big Apple Circus, we were regularly 82, 83% earned mm -hmm. revenue. Um, and people said, oh, isn't that magnificent? And my answer was, no, I'm just a lousy fundraiser. <laughs> you know, if I raised an extra million dollars, the ratio would go down and we'd be you know, better off. So uh, I, I can use that ratio in any number of different ways. I, I think the reality, though, is for our organization is uh, obviously with a lot of performances, a lot of inventory, we're going to rely on ticket sales for a good percentage of our of our revenue. Um, you know, as we try some of the new things we've been talking about, you know, the expectation is that won't necessarily bring in a lot of new revenue, or some of the events that happen in very small, intimate, you know, but wonderful venues just don't have the capacity to generate that revenue. Therefore, we need the underwriting. We need the contributions, like any arts organization. The implications for a celebrity series is that a lot of our funding uh, and our contributions are very much rely on uh, individual patrons. Um, we will raise somewhere over $2 million this year, of which um, clearly three quarters is gonna come from individuals or family foundations, but individually directed giving. Um, now that's kind of quite interesting in a way because it, it sets up a certain kind of relationship between myself and our donors and the organization and their donors because as individuals, you know, individual fundraising I find um, is often based on uh, in essence, anecdotal, heartwarming narrative. You know, they are there for very personal reasons. Right. As opposed to some of the foundations, uh, who we deal with as well, uh, who are, let's say, and want to be supportive of our educational activities, and we do a lot of them, but all of a sudden, you know, th their focus now is much more on the um, kind of rational metrics that demonstrate return on investment, be it test scores, attendance, crime rates, you know, whatever. Right. Um, so I, I do think it, it's quite interesting, particularly for Celebrity Series, that for many of its decades relied on that corporate sponsorship model um, and frankly underplayed its patronage model. Uh, that over the, you know, before even my coming, we started to make that transition and we're, and we're in full flight, you know, going to that um, in a heavily patron-based model. And in managing this organization, you're consistently reinventing, recreating, and refreshing. Absolutely. I mean, it's. In a sense of it's not just the, well, uh, we brought this artist and they did well last time, so let's bring them two years later. It's been long enough. It'll be fine. Um, I, I think that could be an approach. Uh, it probably was over time. 
But now I think there's a constant reassessment of what is that artist doing? Is it, is it something new? Uh, are they remaining interesting or are they basically doing what they do again and again and simply traveling more? Um, our audience, I think over time, even in, I mean, in the celebrity series, I can tell they are more curious in a sense than they've been. Because if you look back at the records, um, Jean-Pierre Rampal, I saw him when I was in college, um, you know, a brilliant artist. And I think he performed a celebrity series, oh, something like 20 times out of 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that kind of uh, experience is going to be repeated in the coming 20 years. It's hard to imagine, there'll probably be a few artists, but um, I think our audience is curious about a constant stream of who's out there, who's doing different things. Um, and of course, with the globalization, we're now much more aware of artists from far flung places that, than we were you know, 20 years ago. Yes, yes. Well, Carrie Dunning, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Celebrity Series in Boston. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, and thank you for your insights. Thanks so much.